Okay, so the recording is on. We're going to just pray together and uh, get started with our class today. Okay, let me um, ask uh, uh, Subhashish, would you like to please pray with us and we can get started? Yes, Pastor. Loving Father, once again, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you, Master, for this beautiful morning. Thank you for bringing us together, Lord, to learn about you, your word. I especially pray for Pastor as Lord, he is teaching us. Lord, I pray that you anoint with your power the Holy Spirit, Lord, whatever, Lord, he will speak, Lord. We may understand and apply in our life. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Okay, so we are in this um, exciting journey of uh, discovering who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ, and uh, we've been, you know, taking things step by step, uh, spending time uh, um, looking at the scriptures and getting to know our identity in Christ. And I just want to remind you that um, as we discover who we are in Christ, uh, the goal is for you and me to learn how to live out of our identity and how to live out of this inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus. You know, uh, the life, everyday life flows out of this. So that's our goal. And of course, we need to know the truth so that we can live out of the truth. And so um, everything that we um, study, that we discover, I want to encourage you personally to say, God, I want to live in it. I want to walk in it. And, you know, God will deal with each of us uh, in uh, different areas of our lives and uh, build us up so that we can live out of these truths. Uh, one of the things that um, I want to encourage each of us to do is to continuously affirm your identity and your inheritance in Christ. That means uh, if you can do it every day, maybe sometimes even you know a few times a day, or uh, affirm these truths about yourself. You know, uh, when you, even when you look at the life of Jesus, many times he affirmed who he was. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. You know, so he was declaring who he is and was. And the Bible teaches us, you know, to affirm that. Uh, I'm just going a little away. I'll come back to the lecture notes. Um, but can somebody read for us uh, Philemon uh, chapter 1, verse 6? There's only one small chapter in the book of Philemon. So that's just before Hebrews in the New Testament. So if you go to Philemon, let me type this here. Philemon chapter 1, verse 6. So one chapter. So usually they say Philemon 6 or... To be more precise, we could say Philemon chapter 1, verse 6. Could somebody read that for us, please? And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. Mm. Okay. So in uh, uh, verse 6, he's saying, uh, I want the fellowship of your faith to become effective by the acknowledgement, the recognition, the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ. So you and I need to acknowledge, which is to recognize as truth, as fact, every good thing that is in us, in Christ. So you acknowledge it, you affirm it. I, you, know, you say, I am a new creation. I have the life and the nature of God in me. Uh, I 
was darkness, but now I'm light. I am in Christ and he is in me. He's the vine, I'm a branch on the vine. And uh, I am the righteousness of God in Christ and I can access, I can come boldly before the throne of grace. I have been sanctified in Christ and uh, I'm set apart and holy unto God. And, and like this, you know, we, we will discover so many things, but you acknowledge every good thing which is in you in Christ. Uh, don't You don't need to talk about all your weaknesses. Everybody knows it. Talk about the good things that are in you, that are in Christ. Acknowledge the good things. Right? So as we continue uh, in this study, as we begin to discover different things, speak that of yourself. Acknowledge the good things that are in you, in Christ. Um, the devil may only want you to see your weakness because when you keep focusing on your weakness, that cripples you, that incapacitates you, uh, that uh, keeps you from moving forward. But God wants you to acknowledge the good things that are in you because you are in Christ Jesus. So acknowledge that and, um, and, and, and you know, declare those things about yourself. Okay. So last week we had a very interesting class. We were talking about being sanctified and uh, towards the end of the class, there were so many different questions on uh, different, different, you know, different things, uh, uh, which are all related to living a holy life, living a sanctified life. Uh, and so we tried to answer that, uh, answer as uh, many of those questions as possible. Uh, uh, did we leave anything unanswered from last week in, in relation to living sanctified, living holy in Christ? Were there any questions? Uh, no, Pastor. Okay. All right. So I think we covered everything. Okay. So let's go ahead with this quickly review and then we move forward. So I'm going to share the uh, PDF, right? So we're talking about sanctified, being holy. We talked about Christ, our sanctification, uh, being sanctified in Christ. We've been set apart. And so we actually start off from a place of holiness and we live that out. We are saints or holy ones in Christ. Uh, we are a holy temple collectively. We are a holy people. Uh, we have been sanctified, but we are also being sanctified. We are living out uh, that sanctified life. We covered all this last week. And uh, we are sanctified by the word of God and the Holy Spirit as God works in us by his word and by his spirit. And then we were talking about this, you know, living sanctified in Christ. Uh, we have to possess our wrestle, uh, our cells, uh, our bodies in holiness and honor. Uh, we, when we walk in love, we walk in holiness. We said that. And uh, we thought we were discussing this, you know, we we have sanctified standards and values. And this is where we are renewed in our, uh, we are transformed in our life, the way we live by the renewing of our mind. So we said that, uh, we talked about, uh, uh, you know, that our sanctified life actually reveals the virtues of God. Uh, let's just pick up a few, uh, the last few things that uh, we wanted to look at, and then we'll close off this chapter. Uh, could somebody read for us Second uh, Timothy chapter, so Second Timothy chapter two, verses nineteen to twenty-one? So that's right on uh, in your PDF, Second uh, Timothy chapter two, nineteen to twenty-one. We just want to finish a few more things, so that we will go to the next chapter. Could somebody read this for us, please? Go ahead. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 to 21. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Amen. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, again, these verses are talking about being sanctified. 
and uh, you know, but they are in the context of uh, you know serving God, because this whole book, or especially the book, the Epistle of Paul, second, first and second Timothy, Paul is writing uh, to a young man, uh, a young, I would say, young man, whom he has nurtured, and now he is in the ministry. You know, Paul refers to Timothy and says, Timothy does the work of the Lord just as I do. So he's nurtured him up to that place. And so now here he's giving him, to, speaking to him about the ministry. But I just want you to follow what's happening here in these three verses. Paul has in his mind a great house. A great house. You can imagine, you know, a, a, a big building, a big building, a great house. You know, a, a great not only in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the size of the building, but a, a, you know, a very honorable, uh, esteemed house, you know, and a great house, you know, a, a very a noble house, you know, so big building, but it's um, a great house. So as he talks about this, he's having this picture, you know, big building, and as he's thinking about this, he starts off with the foundation. He says, and of course, he's talking about the house of God, right? And he says, you know, it, it, this great house has a solid foundation. It has an unshakable foundation. Okay. Uh, uh, this is God's house. God's house has an unshakable foundation. And what is that foundation? He says, you know, this foundation is characterized by two things. So having the seal, this mark, this or, uh, this inscription, or this, you know, this this foundation of this great house of God has these two uh, you know inscriptions on it that means it is telling us two very important things what is it first it says God knows those who are his so God the foundation of God's house is God knows those who belong to him right so that's the first foundation so you and I are established in that God knows you God knows me that's the foundation of his house. He knows his people. He knows each one. Okay, that's a solid foundation. You and I are part of that house. But there's another important part to this foundation. And that found the, the foundation is solid. I mean, you can't alter this, you cannot change this. The other aspect of the solid foundation of God's house is everyone who names the name of Christ must depart from sin. So that's the second part. That everyone who names, that means if you are actually speaking and bearing the name of Jesus, you depart from sin. And this is foundation to the house of God, of being part of the house of God. So this is what we've been, we've been talking about, of living sanctified, of living holy and this is foundational to the house of god this is what god's house is this great house of god is built on that god knows his people and everyone known by god who bears his name does not live in sin they depart from iniquity it's foundational but then not only does he give us that understanding but then he says okay let's go into the house when he comments of house, of course, he says, you know, a great house, there are all kinds of utensils. Some utensils are for noble purposes, some for, you know, dishonorable. So example, I'm just saying example, okay? Uh, there's a trash can. And there, are, there could be many trash cans. So people throw trash in it, and then they collect it, and they throw it out. So, you know, you could think of those, you know, those uh, uh, trash cans as, uh, you know, meant for, okay, dishonorable use. You know, I'm, I'm just giving example, right? So Paul has in his mind this great house, and there are all kinds of things there. But he says, look, uh, there are vessels or utensils that are very uh, noble, that are very, uh, you know, that, uh, that the people and the, the, the master of the house would use in a very noble way, in a very honorable way. So you, you can ha imagine, you know, if they're having a great feast or a great meal, and uh, you know they'll bring out the best utensils and they will, uh, you know, serve food on those things. So he's having that picture in his mind, a big house. He's talked about the foundation. Now he's got into the house. He's talking about the utensils, and when he's talking about the utensils, then he applies it to us as believers in verse 21. 
he says, okay, if you want to be, you know, those, those utensils that are, you know, used for very honorable purposes, here's what you need to do. He says, if anyone, that means this is available to all believers. If anyone cleanses himself, okay, so you are purging yourself, you're separating yourself. Now notice, at the very beginning of this chapter, we said that God has separated us. We have been sanctified. But now, it's almost like the tables are turned, and God is saying, now I want you to do something. I want you to cleanse yourself or to keep yourself clean, to purge yourself, to separate yourself from things that are dishonorable, right? So God has done his part of setting each of us apart to himself. He knows us, but now he's saying, I want you to live that way, live a set apart life. Cleanse yourself from the latter. The latter is anything that is dishonorable, right? Anything that is dishonorable, you separate yourself from that. Then what will happen? You will be like one of these utensils of honor, right? You will be a vessel of honor that uh, the master of the house is going to use. And uh, what about the vessel of honor? First of all, it is sanctified. I mean, it's, it's been set apart. But who's setting it apart? You are setting yourself apart. That's the context. God has already sanctified you. But now you and I, with the desire to be a vessel of honor, are sanctifying ourselves. It's a deliberate action from our part. We are sanctifying ourselves. And so a vessel of honor is a sanctified vessel. It's also a useful vessel. So uh, when, you, when, when, you, when you look at the Greek there, when it says useful, it means three things. Okay, uh, the, the word useful there. It is uh, fit to be used, fit to be used, okay? It is profitable, uh, it is, so let me say, it's easy to use. And thirdly, it is profitable to be used. So this word useful in that word has these three connotations. It's fit to be used, it's easy to be used, and it's profitable to be used. So when it says, uh, what is a vessel of honor? A vessel of honor is a sanctified vessel. A vessel of honor is a useful vessel. The father, the master says, hey, that's fit, that's easy, and that's profitable. I mean, that's the right utensil for me to use it use in this case, you know, so you're ready for use. And you're prepared, you're prepared. And again, the word prepared has two things. One, you're equipped. Secondly, you're um, uh, prepared, means you're ready, you're willing, right? So there's talking, talking about equipping, it's talking about readiness. You're equipped and you're ready for every good work. So what I want us to take away from this passage is that being sanctified is part, uh, um, is, 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 is an important part of being uh, in the house of God and of being a vessel of honor that the master wants for every good work. Okay, for every good work. So, if you and I, I'm sure all of us, that's one of the reasons why we are in Bible college, we are spending time uh, learning and studying because we want uh, God to work through us and do every good thing he wants to do through us. But in order to do that, we live sanctified. And of course, we are becoming useful and becoming prepared. You know, we are learning how to do that. God has already sanctified us, but now he's inviting us to cleanse ourselves and says, okay, you keep yourself clean, you purge yourself so that I can work through you for every good thing that he wants to do through you. Okay, so sanctified, uh, being sanctified vessel is an important part of being a vessel of honor. And, uh, Lastly, I think this is the last point, or yeah, two points here, is um, 
when we live sanctified lives, we will face persecution or we, people will laugh at us. You know, uh, example is if you are a young person in college or school or college and, you know, you are uh, living a holy life, your friends may laugh at you. Your friends will invite you to do all the wrong things. And, and you say, no, I don't want to be a part of it. I, I, sorry, I cannot go with you. I cannot, you know, participate in those things. I said, why not? And, you know, they may make fun of you, but you are going to take your stand. Now, uh, as adults, it, it could happen differently. Maybe in our places of work or in the people that we, uh, you know, move around with. Uh, they may say things, they may sometimes even counsel us to do wrong things or give us advice in certain things that are uh, not, uh, you know, that are not pleasing to God. And then you are making, you and I, we make a deliberate choice. No, 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 I will not do that. I will not go down that path. I will not do those kinds of things. And as we make those deliberate choices, what will happen? They may laugh at us. And Jesus, you know, while he said, said, sanctify he prays he's praying here for us he says sanctify them by your word and then he says you know i, I have sent them into the world as you send me the world i have sent them also into the world and what will happen he says the world hate would hate them right so the world doesn't deal kindly with people who have the word of god who live by the word of God, the world doesn't necessarily, of course, will not understand us and will not treat us well. So there's, there's the hate and the persecution and sometimes they make fun about our stand on certain things. But Jesus warned us, you know, you're having my word. The world is going to hate you. And it's part of living sanctified in Christ. And Paul, you know, says this, all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. So we must be prepared. Don't let the pressure of persecution or people, you know, uh, the people making fun of you and so on, cause you to give up on living sanctified for Christ. Right? And uh, lastly, we also see that God is at work to sanct is sanctifying us completely, right? So that our whole spirit, soul, and body is blameless. So what is God doing in your life and mine? He's working to sanctify us completely. Every part of our being, whole spirit, soul, and body. Whole spirit, soul, and body. Our entire being is to be kept blameless, right? And uh, so that's what God is working. So that we come to this place where we are living blameless before God, spirit, soul, and body. Okay. So that brings us to the end of this, this whole uh, lesson on sanctification. I'm going to pause here to see if there are any questions and before we get into the next chapter. Okay. So what did we learn in this lesson? That God... In Christ, you are sanctified. In Christ, you are a holy person. God has already done that for you. He's set you apart. Now, he says, in your everyday life on earth, I want you to live a sanctified life. Live a holy life by the empowering of his word and his spirit in your life. And then, of course, there are the outcomes of that, which is uh, we are transformed. We are vessels of honor. We reveal the virtues of our God and uh, we may face persecution, but we stand firm through those things. Okay. Any questions on this chapter before we move into the next? Everything is clear? Okay. Silence means everything is okay. <laughs> um, but if you have questions, feel uh, please don't hesitate to ask. All right. Uh, we're going to go into the next chapter. So, somebody's trying to come into class. Let them let me 
let them come in, let them join. Okay. All right. Uh, let me, so the next chapter is on a truth called identification. Identification. And uh, this is a very powerful truth. And I want us to try and understand the truth of identification. Paul introduces this truth for us in Romans chapter 5. So if you could turn to me to Romans chapter 5. And uh, uh, let us read. I would like somebody to read for us Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 19. Now, this is not in your notes, um, uh, uh, so I'm just kind of introducing it and then we'll get into the notes because the main part is in Romans 6 but before he actually starts talking about that he introduces this truth in Romans chapter 5 so could somebody please read for us Romans chapter 5 verses 12 to 19 Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned, for until the law, the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Okay, good. Somebody read verses 16 to 19. Somebody else. Verses 16 to 19. Thank you, Roslyn. Somebody could read verses. Verse 16. The gift is not like that which came through the one who's. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transition. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Mm. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you. So, in these verses, for the very first time, Paul introduces the truth of identification. And very interestingly, he never writes about this anywhere else, except in First Corinthians 15, a little bit. We will look at it. Uh, maybe you'll look at it, I'm not sure. But this is the only place he's actually bringing this out for us in all of his episodes. And I will summarize it for you, And but I encourage you to read these verses, think about it, study it. What he's saying is, one man, Adam. One man, Adam. He sinned. And because of Adam's sin, death came into this world. So Adam's disobedience, sin came, death came, and there was condemnation on all. So... In Adam, all die. In Adam, all are in subject to sin, Satan, sickness, 
condemnation, the consequences of sin, anything and everything that represents death. So sin is the beginning, death is the finality. And in between are all the other issues that are the products of sin leading to death, which is sickness, everything, everything in between sin and death. One man sinned, one man was disobedient, sin came into this world, and all the things came in because of sin, ultimately resulting in death. But then he says in verse 14, Adam was a type of him who was to come. So he is not the real man. He's only a type, a prototype. The real man is the Lord from heaven. He's referred to in 1 Corinthians 15 as the last Adam, as the second man. Garden of Eden was the first Adam. Jesus Christ is the last Adam. Garden of Eden, he was a first man, Jesus Christ, the second man. In the first man, everybody is brought under sin. Everything that comes because of sin, ultimately resulting in death. Sin, condemnation, death. But he says, there's a solution. In the last Adam, or the second man, everybody who comes in, everybody believes in this, those of us who believe, in the last Adam and the second man, we have the free gift. The free gift brings us the grace of God, the gift of righteousness, puts us in a place where we reign in life, and we have fullness of life. So, in Adam, we all die. In Christ, we're all made alive. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, just as we have borne the image of the earthly, and I'm, I'm looking at verses 45 to 49 in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. Okay. So it says, in the first man, we, are, we, we bear the image of the natural. We all die. In the last Adam, the second man, we bear the image of the heavenly man. We have life from heaven. We have eternal life. So this is identification. The entire human race, the entire human race is identified in one man. And what happened to the one affects the whole human race. One man, I'm repeating, one man was disobedient, sin, judgment, condemnation, and death passed to the whole human race. The whole human race became recipients of what happened to the one man. But there came another man. This man is the last Adam. Why is he the last Adam? Because in him, everything ends. What started in Adam comes to an end in Christ. Sin, condemnation, death comes to an end. He's the last Adam. He's the second man. Why is he second man? Because something new begins in him, which is different from the first man. In the second man, we have received a free gift. We receive abundance of grace. We receive the gift of righteousness. The first man put us in subjection to sin, sickness, Satan, and death. The second man makes us kings in life. That's Romans 5.17, which we just read. He gives us a free gift, which brings the, the grace of God, the righteousness of God, and makes us kings in life. We rule in life. That means in Christ, we become rulers. 
in Adam, we have become slave. We were made slaves. We were brought in subjection. In Christ, we are made rulers. We are put in a place of dominion over everything Adam brought us under. So in one man, Adam, everybody's brought to subjection to sin, condemnation and death. In the second man, second man or the last Adam, all of us who believe in him receive the free gift, receive grace, abundance of grace, receive the gift of righteousness, receive the authority to rule and reign, have dominion in this life. We are identified in the second man. So we have to learn to live out of the second man or the last Adam. In, this, in the last Adam, everything of the first Adam stops. Stops. That's why he's called the last Adam. So when we are identified with Christ, nothing of the first Adam permitted to continue in us. Now, of course, in the natural, we have the physical body, which God created in the very beginning. And this body will die physically, but God will give us glorified bodies. But in the spirit, everything that came from the first Adam ceases in the last Adam. Things are different now, and we are in the last Adam, the second man. Are you with me so far? Any questions? Everybody's very quiet. Um, is that yes or a no? Yes, Pastor. Okay, you understood? Okay. So, he introduces this truth of identification in Romans 5. Okay? Right? Okay, I see Shani says, uh, uh, can you repeat that again? Okay. So in Romans 5, verses, uh, I'm just going to repeat, right? Just uh, in a very concise way. In Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 19, Paul is beginning to unveil to us the truth of identification. Identification means what happened to one man affects the entire human race who are connected to that one man. Okay? So, there is Adam, the first man. He was disobedient. And because of his disobedience, what happened? Sin came into this world. Romans 5 verse 12, the very first verse we read. Sin came into this world. And because of that, there was condemnation or judgment. And because of that, there was also death. Everything that destroyed. So his disobedience... Because of his disobedience, every human person right, is brought in subjection to sin, sickness, Satan, and death. Because we're identified in that one man. What happened to him affects the whole human race. But then, the Bible says, there is the another man. The second man. This is Jesus Christ. He's referred to as the last Adam. And so this is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 45 to 49. The last Adam. Why is he called the last Adam? Because he is an end, full stop, to whatever everything that started in the first Adam. Comes to a close. End full stop in the last Adam, that is Jesus Christ. So the reign of sin, sickness, Satan, death that came in through the first man comes to an end, that came through the first Adam comes to an end in the second Adam. And in the second Adam, what do we have? We read in this passage, we receive the free gift of God. What is the free gift of God? It brings us abundance of grace, the grace of God. It brings us the gift of righteousness. 
It brings us the life of God and it puts us in a place of dominion and authority. We become rulers in life. We reign in life, it says here in verse 17. So we all have, we all have our identity in the first Adam. That's, that was the beginning, you know. We were born of Adam's race. But when we were born again, when we became new creation, our identity shifted. Our identity shifted from the first Adam to the second, uh, to the last Adam or the second man. Today, our identity comes from the real man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Christ, we receive the free gift of God, abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness, the life of God, and we reign in life. We have authority and dominion in life. That is identification. That is what God has done for all of us. I hope it's clear uh, for all of us, uh, okay? So he introduces, Sonny, is it clear or you have any more questions uh, on that? Oh yes, that was fine, thank you. That was clear. Okay, okay. So Paul introduces this truth to us. He says, hey, all of us are in the, I mean, the believers, he's talking about believers, he's not just talking to the world, he's talking about those of us who believe in Jesus. Okay, all of us who believe in Jesus, we are identified with the last Adam, who is the second man. He's a, the real. Adam was a prototype. Jesus is the real. We are identified in him. And so what do we have? We have the free gift of God, and we have the grace of God. Then he says, you know, he goes into chapter six now. So I've just summarized chapter five. He goes into chapter six. And so let us read. Can somebody read chapter six, verse one and two? So now I'm now I'm actually following the notes, right? The PDF. But um, now we will get into chapter six, Romans chapter six, verse one and two, please. Somebody could read that. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 What shall we say then shall we go on sinning that grace may increase by no means we died to sin how can we live in it any longer hmm. so paul has told us you know chapter 5 uh, remember when 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 the when the when the, when, when uh, the new testament the bible was written it wasn't written you know in chapter and verse it was written as one continuous uh, you know a long uh, letter it was written with a continuous flow of thought so in chapter 5 you know he has just finished telling us look we are identified in the second man the last adam and uh, we have grace we have God's free gift of righteousness, and uh, He has made us, you know, to reign and life. All those wonderful things have happened to us. And then He asks the question, verse chapter six, verse one. So, should we then just continue in sin so that grace can abound? Meaning, God has been so good to us; uh, He's given us abundance of grace. So, should we just keep on sinning so that God can just keep on pouring His grace? And he says, hey, wait a minute. I need to tell you something more about identification. I need to tell you something more. That's verse two. He says, of course not. We're not going to continue sinning because there's more to this identification because we have died to sin. And if we have died to sin, we can't live in it anymore. So, you know, a simple analogy that I use uh, every time I talk about this is, you know, you think about a man who was an alcoholic, okay? 
uh, he was just totally bound by his addiction to alcohol. Um, just imagine, okay, just imagine. From morning till evening, he's he just drinks and he just ruins his life drinking. And let's say this man is dead, he dies. You've got his body. And around his dead body, you place all his favorite alcoholic beverages. He's not going to move even his little finger. Why? Because he's dead. So Paul is saying, how can we who are dead live in sin any longer? We are dead. You put it all around us, we're not going to respond. We are dead. But then it's, hey, Paul, what do you mean? We are dead. When did we die? I mean, you just told us, you know, in Christ, we've got the free gift of God. In Christ, we have uh, abundance of grace and righteousness and eternal life. And, uh, you know, we have dominion. and We're going to rule in life. When did we die? Okay. Paul goes back to that same truth of identification. And he says, because we're identified with Jesus, in as much as we have, you know, received the free gift of God, we've received grace and righteousness and eternal life and dominion. Some more things God did. We are identified with Christ in his crucifixion, in his burial, in his resurrection, in his ascension, and in his exaltation or a seating at the right hand of God. Now, the truth of identification, I'm just going to say a few things and I know our break time is coming up. Uh, the truth of identification is very interesting. Adam, Adam, the first man, Adam, lived about 6,000 years ago. We are here 6,000 years later. But what happened to him affects us today. And we were identified with Adam in his disobedience. Christ died 2,000 years ago. We were not around at that time. But the Bible is telling us we were identified with Christ and what he did affects us today. So the truth of identification is what happened to Christ affects me today. There is a spiritual reality in that and I walk in it, we walk in it experientially, we walk in it in everyday life. And not only are we blessed by his, his obedience, because his obedience has brought us the free gift of God, God's abundant grace, the gift of righteousness, eternal life, and dominion and authority. But also, when Christ died, you and I died. When Christ was buried, you and I were buried. When Christ was resurrected, you and I were resurrected. When Christ ascended, you and I ascended. And when Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father, you and I were seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, we were not around 2,000 years ago. But in the mind of God, we were there. What happened to Christ affects us today. That is because of identification. So we're going to take a break. Uh, we will come back and read the scriptures here in Romans 6, where Paul explains this for us. And you'll read the scriptures, and then we will talk about what it means. What does it mean? Uh, how do we live out of this truth of identification? Okay? And we'll have some time for questions. I know this may be a little stretching our spiritual understanding a bit, 
Um, but, uh, you know, just take some time to digest it. And it's very powerful. Okay. Let's take a break and we'll come back. Pick this up. 